afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so my name is Ruth McNerney. Please, if you find I'm speaking too quickly or my English is not clear, send a quick message and someone will tell me to slow down and make it simpler for you. So if I could have the first slide, please. So I, I'm going to talk about tuberculosis. It's, a, it's quite a complicated disease compared to many others. You can become infected with the bacteria, but you don't necessarily develop active tuberculosis. You can have what we call the latent disease, or you might just completely, your immune system might just completely clear the infection of the bacteria. However, some people do develop active disease, and this can happen quite quickly, or it can even happen after several years. We also know that some people who remain untreated can go into quiescence or cure, or obviously you can be cured by drugs. So it's quite a complicated disease. If we go for the next slide, if you're unlucky, though, you can get TB again and again. You don't get immunity from having TB like you do from measles and many other infections. And for the next slide, if you're really unlucky, you can actually have two TB infections at the same time. And it's not unknown that someone will go to a hospital with drug-sensitive TB and be parked in a bed next to someone with drug-resistant TB and then catch the second infection. So it's a very complicated disease, and it means that looking at the immune system for markers of the infection is quite difficult. Um, symptoms vary depending on where the disease affects. Um, we now know that the type of TB bacteria, the slightly different types, might have a different immune response. So it's a very difficult disease to detect. Next slide. So to control TB, we know we have to detect infectious cases as quickly as we can and get them onto effective treatment. And that's the best way to stop TB spreading as, as someone gets onto treatment. They very quickly become non-infectious. However, if we ever want to eradicate TB and remove TB from the world, we have to do something about the pool of, of latent TB cases who could progress at some later stage to infectious disease and start in infecting people. So we need like a dual strategy. Next. So I'm going to talk today mainly about detecting tuberculosis and the diagnostic tests that are used. I'm not going to talk a lot about the symptoms, or I'm not going to talk about really the diagnostic algorithms. Do you use an X-ray first, or a gene expert first, or a smear first? I'm going to run through the tests quite quickly. I'm going to very quickly cover mentioned latent tuberculosis, pulmonary TB, which is in the lungs, extra pulmonary TB is outside of the lungs. Pediatric TB has special challenges, and um, at the end we'll also quickly mention drug resistance, which is becoming a, a much bigger problem these days. Next. So latent tuberculosis. This is when you have uh, some evidence that you've been infected with tuberculosis, the bacteria, mycobacteria, and tuberculosis, but there's no evidence that you have actual disease. You're not symptomatic, uh, and you can't find the bacteria anywhere. There are two commonly used technologies. One is a skin test, where a, a mixture of proteins and cell wall material from bacteria are injected just under the skin, and you look for an allergic reaction. You come back a day or two later, look for an allergic reaction. And then there's interferon gamma release assays, so called IGRAs. These take a sample of blood, mix them with some TB antigens. And, and see what the uh, immune response is and whether your gamma interferon levels should go up or, or not. Um, so both the tests work. Um, the IGRA test was actually developed for cows initially, um, but it's now been um, adapted for human use. And I have on this slide, it was developed by Celtestis, an Australian company, the ELISA quantiferon test. This is now, a company is now being bought by Kaijin, and it's, it's sold by a company called, a big international company called Kaijin. Next slide. Unfortunately, these tests aren't that helpful because they don't really predict who has active TB, who has latent TB, who has latent TB that might be progressed to be active TB, so we could call it subclinical disease. And the WHO recommended actually that these tests shouldn't be used in high burden countries. They're quite expensive and complicated, and they're difficult to interpret. 
And in high burden countries, nearly everyone will be positive because everyone has been exposed to TB at some point. So in, in some countries in Europe with a low burden, or the USA with a low burden of TB, they can be quite useful if someone's going to go in for a cancer therapy or immunosuppressive therapy in some way. They can find out if they've been exposed to TB, if they have, perhaps treat the TB. But in a high incidence country, they're really recommended not to be used. Next. So diagnosis is so important in TB, it's a gateway to treatment and control. If we don't detect TB cases, they go on, uh, particularly pulmonary cases, they just go on to con continue transmitting disease unwittingly and infecting them. So we're, we're failing very badly at the moment. I'm sure Eric is going to talk about this a little bit more later. Next. So really just this Approaches to finding and detecting TB can be divided into two, poor settings and richer settings. In low resource settings, it's really waiting for someone to come to the health centre who says that they have got symptoms for TB and then testing them using some fairly simple tests. In high resource settings, you wait for people to come to you. If someone does come to you, then don't just test them. You'll go out and do active case finding. If they've got TB, you'll talk to their family, you'll test their family, you'll test their friends, you'll test the people they work with. And that makes a huge difference in TB control because then you pick up very early cases before they started transmitting. In low income area, you'll have a smear, microscopy done. Occasionally, some places have culture, but that's quite rare. And you may get a, an x ray. And in some settings now, the gene expert will talk about this test a little bit further on. Uh, it's a molecular test. In the high resource settings, you get everything. You'll get the smear, the culture, various molecular tests, lots of drug resistance tests. Um, so it's quite a different approach. One thing across all settings, so if someone's HIV positive and they're at all symptomatic or not, you should test for TB. And now also, if someone has TB, you should also test for HIV because the two diseases are just so often seen together. Next. So case finding strategies, it, it's very dependent on what resources available. The lowest, well, cheapest being the passive case finding use. You only look at people who come through the clinic seeking help. And the next step up is to ask them if they, you know, anyone in their family has been uh, coughing or is sick and do some contact tracing. And that can be expanded to actually screening high risk groups that might be going into hospital screening all the nurses or screening teachers or people who think you might have been exposed. You can actually go further than that and actually screen whole communities. In the 1950s in Europe and the North of America and Canada, uh, there were mass screening campaigns in the towns and the cities where TB was quite high at that time. And it literally meant they, they screened hundreds of thousands of people by x-rays and they found out who had TB. And at that time, treatment had just become available, effective treatments, and they treated them. And it's very infect effective at stopping the TB epidemic. Um, that's considered by many people not practical in Africa and most parts of Asia and high burden countries. The other uh, very expensive uh, strategy would be to screen everyone for latent TB. In the USA, this is policy. You screen anyone that comes into the country, anyone you think at risk for latent TB, and then you treat them for latent TB um, to try and solve the problem. I think that's almost the only country in the world where it, it's employed on such a scale. In the, in the UK, we, we screen people if we just think they're high risk, but it's voluntary, and it's then voluntary if they take the treatments or not. So we now move on to diagnostic tests that are used. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to say that diagnosing TB, detecting TB is a complicated process. It's not all about the, the test. We don't have a magic bullet test that can be used. So the reason people fail to get diagnosed or fail, TBs fail to be detected, is many, many reasons. A lot of it's inconvenience. TB doesn't hurt very much in the initial phases, so people quite often delay to go and seek treatment. In, in certain parts of the world, people, a lot of people have a cough, they might be smokers, they might cook over an open fire, it might be flu season, so they've been coughing for a while. Um, sometimes the costs are very difficult, and another big issue is stigma. People, are, particularly in parts of Asia, are very, very 
concern that people don't know that they may have TB. In India, for example, it's, it's caused with divorce. If your wife has TB, you can get letters signed and it gives you grounds for divorce. So there's lots of reasons why people delay going for a diagnosis. And then, of course, when they go for diagnosis, there's all sorts of reasons why they might not get diagnosed. They might not get a good specimen. There might not be the resources. There might not be someone to look down the microscope that day. Microscope bulb might have gone. Um, and then the techniques themselves aren't very friendly to use and aren't very sensitive. Next slide. So this is just a way, again, of, of presenting what I've just said on the previous slide. Lots of reasons. It might be a failure of the health system. It might be a failure of the technology. It might be that someone goes and seeks a diagnosis but never goes back to get the results. It might be failure to seek diagnosis in the first place for all sorts of different reasons. So when we're looking at the diagnostic, we've got to look much broader than how sensitive is a test. It, 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 we've got to look at the whole, whole pathway that someone has to follow to get diagnosed. Next. What we really need is an accurate test, a rapid test like the HIV rapid test or the malaria tests, where it takes a few minutes and can be done in almost anywhere as a screening test. We don't have this for TB yet. Um, people are working on it. Um, but it, it would solve a lot of the problems around the health systems. Uh, as you'll see, we, we have quite complicated tests we have to use for TB. Next. So one thing, an important thing to say is that serological tests are being sold for tuberculosis, but they are currently unreliable, and they should not be used. Um, people, have, the temptation is there to sell a test alongside an you know, HIV test, as a simple, easy to cheap, fast test. They've been shown time and time again to not be reliable. Um, so Gabriel O.H. show for the first time ever a few years ago, they actually said, please do not use this type of test. They've never done a negative endorsement before, but it really is a problem in some parts of the world where people are using unreliable tests unwittingly. Um, they go and realize they're unreliable. They've been sold the story by the manufacturers and people are selling them. But the message is to be clear that serological tests currently are not good for diagnosing tuberculosis. Now, x-rays and uh, radiography and imaging can be very helpful. Um, they can be quite non-specific for people who are severely immunosuppressed. When HIV first uh, really uh, arose and emerged in Africa, people suddenly realized that the X-ray, chest X-rays they were looking at no longer were very useful for TB. The symptoms are quite different. You haven't got that strong immune response that causes the lung damage. However, X-rays can be very useful in the past and can be very useful and can also be useful for monitoring treatment. If someone's getting better on our lungs repairing themselves. One initiative that's going on is a digital x-ray, where uh, digital x-rays are a lot easier to use than the traditional x-rays. Um, they're cleaner, nicer, quicker, and the images can be sent electronically to an expert if you want a second opinion, which is very nice. There's been a move to try and automate the reading of x-rays. At the moment, you need an expert, a pulmonologist or an audiologist to actually spot whether there's an abnormality or not. But they have been trying to design computer programs that will read whether the x-ray is abnormal or not. I think the consensus at the moment is there's not quite enough evidence to know how useful they are at the moment. Uh, but it's an area certainly to watch. And what we need to do to, to decide if someone has TB is actually find if the bacteria is there or not. So that means either finding the bacteria by looking down the microscope and seeing it, or finding some DNA or a protein or some sign that the bacteria is actually there. And that means as soon as you find evidence of bacteria, it's a TB case. Next slide, please. So the challenge is, it, is the bacteria are very difficult to find. Uh, they're not floating around the blood like malaria is very easy to find. Uh, in the Plumbery TB, you may find it in the lung, sorry, in the sputum. This is not saliva, this is actually coughed up gunk uh, material from the, from the lung. Um, so it's quite difficult to get a good quality sample from people sometimes, particularly difficult from children, and quite often people who are HIV positive and are still immunosuppressed, um, they have trouble producing samples as well. 
Next slide. So it's quite important that when you ask someone to give you a sample of sputum, you explain what sputum is and get a good quality sample. And there are aids and posters and little videos and stuff available now to help that. Um, one, for people who can't expectorate a cough up sputum from their lungs, it is possible to use a fine spray. If you inhale a, flame, a fine spray of senna, you'll cough and you will then cough up your, your sputum. So that's a way of, if you've got some qualified, uh, that's a way of actually improving the, the, the sample you're getting from someone. Next slide. You have to be very careful when collecting samples, though, because the TB is infectious. It's carried in the air in tiny aerosols. And when someone coughs or sneezes or tries to produce sputum, they're producing probably many thousands of infected particles. So you must make sure you're not at danger of breathing them in. So often people are asked to go outside into the fresh air or into specialist cubicle, which can be disinfected and has a negative uh, fan to make sure no one is exposed in the room. And that's for both for health staff and for other patients. Next. So in smear microscopy, this is where you treat the sample, you try and get the bugs out of the sample and concentrate them, and you then stain them. And TB is an unusual bacteria, and it can be stained uh, differently to other bacteria. So it's quite a good test. The problem being there are so few bacteria there, it's actually quite difficult to see them. You end up looking down the microscope for a long time. So it's an insensitive test. So the recommendation you do at least two and possibly three separate samples per person. So it's quite intensive, labor intensive. It's quite a skilled job as well. Many people say, oh, it's simple, it's not, you know, not sophisticated. Actually, a skilled microscopist takes quite a few years to get that skill before they can really see what's going on. Um, it doesn't differentiate TB from other similar mycobacteria, which is a problem in some parts of the world where you've got maybe avian or all miners, there's a, a, a bacteria called Kansasi that might confuse things. The problem there is that the treatments are slightly different. But in most parts of the world, it's a pretty good test, except the sensitivity is very low. So you're picking up people who are just with heavy, very heavy disease. You don't pick up people in the early stages of disease. One initiative that's taken over in the past decade is light microscopes are no longer used. The people use LED microscopes. They're in much better value to see more robust uh, than the other fluorescence microscopes. Um, so many, many labs have now switched over to different stains, oramin stains and the LED microscopes. Next. This is just pictures to show you what TV looks like if we haven't seen. At the top left hand, this is uh, Bacteria, the little red, as if you like, the little red rods, the bacterial term is rods, they are the bacteria. So this would be a very heavy infection. This was sputum that's been stained. Uh, it would be heavy infection. You straight away say, gosh, this person has TB. Next to it, there's an electron microscopy of these bacteria, just to show you they are rod shaped. Um, and below is, is what it looks like when it grows on solid culture media. They grow in quite unusual. And very distinctive colonies. You say, oh gosh, that looks like TB. So next. The problem with TB is it grows very, very slowly. Uh, a, a, a bacteria like E. coli might give your stomach upset, you might divide every 15 minutes. TB takes all day, literally. So it means uh, you can do an overnight culture of some bacteria and there'll be enough there to see. Whereas uh, you know, overnight you see nothing from TB, and it might take two or three weeks before you see anything. And sometimes it takes even longer than that. It can take weeks uh, before it grows. It's a bit quicker if you grow in liquid broths rather than a solid culture, but it's a slow process. Uh, next slide, please. So culture is still the best, most sensitive test. It's like the gold standard if we have one in TB. Uh, so it's the test that most of the tests are compared against. It's far from being perfect, but it works. The main problem is uh, safety. Because you're growing lots of TB, which is very, very infectious, you need very careful handling and safety facilities, and these aren't readily available. You need specialist labs and specialist trained staff to do this. Um, so it's not often, in many countries, it's just one lab or two labs can do culture. It's important technique because it's used for doing drug resistance testing. 
um, but it's not practical. And many patients, you can't, you know, if you tell them, oh, can we come back in three or four weeks for your culture result, you won't see them. They'll gone off and try to find something else. Next slide, please. So what happens for this disease and many others is the nucleic acid amplification test. This is the PCRs that amplifying the DNA. Oh, your RNA. Normally it's the DNA amplified. This has lots of advantages. It can be quite fast. It can be very specific. You can look at the DNA. You can look for drug resistance mutations. And because it doesn't need live bacteria, it's a lot safer. You can treat the sample as soon as you get it to kill the bacteria so you're not handling infectious material. The downside is you have to actually be able to find the DNA, and for TB that's not always easy. Um, very difficult to get the, D, T, sorry, the DNA out of the bacteria, there's, there's a lot of challenges there. Um, so you need quite a lot of sample processing, and this needs uh, quite a good laboratory service and well-trained technical staff. Um, the other problem is, is it doesn't differentiate between live and dead bacteria, so you can't use it to monitor treatment. If someone's had TB4, TB before, you're not quite sure if it's with just DNA that should stay there or whether it's a new infection they've got. So you, you just shouldn't monitor treatments using nucleic acid. But they work. Next slide, please. So the first generation was a standard uh, laboratory-based tests. Uh, there were a couple who got FDA approval. They worked well. I was, uh, used one in, in Zambia. It worked very well. Um, Someone else tried the Roche one in the, in Kenya, and again, it worked very well. Um, the problem with them was you needed quite a good lab to do your sample extraction and clean up your sample and prepare your DNA. Um, and they, they were also seen at that time as being quite expensive. Where they are good, if you have a reference lab that is trained in this work, they're, much, they're good at batching. You can do large numbers of samples, which makes them more cost effective than some other techniques. Um, but they were never really taken up. And it's mainly because the expertise in methodology, when they're introduced, just wasn't there in high burden countries. So they get used a lot in Europe, a lot in the USA, but a lot of the high burden TV countries just said, no, this is too difficult for us to implement. Next slide. So second generation is really the gene expert from a company called Cefe. They're, um, I'm sorry, I, thought, I think I might have spelled Cefe wrong there. Anyway, gene expert from Cephid, an American company. This is technology that was developed to look for anthrax in America in post offices. It's, it's homeland defense funding. Um, so they set up this new technology that could be used outside of a lab. So it's based on PCR. So the basal basis is the same as the other t previous tests. But what's so different is a sample prep. They have a cassette. You put your sputum in a cassette, shake it leave it for about 15 minutes, then you put it in the machine and press a button, and then you get the answer about an hour and a half to two hours later. So this was a bit of a revolution for many labs. Suddenly, labs could do this test that were unable to do the ordinary nucleic acid tests. It was endorsed very late in uh, 2010 by WHO. And it has, it has many, many fans around the world, and it's, it's been well rolled out and taken up in many countries. But there are some downsides on it. So we go to the next slide. So, so this is just to show you how simple it is. You simply put your, your sample in the cassette, which is a very sophisticated little instrument. It looks, looks like a little plastic box, but it's got a lot of sophisticated engineering inside. The downside of that is it's actually very expensive to produce. So there's a limit to how cheap it can be made. But if it works well, you put it in an instrument, you press your button, and assuming you, everything is working, you've got your computer up and running, then you get your, your results. And there's some built in controls, so it tells you if, if the thing has failed, it will tell you, oh, I'm sorry, it's failed, the filter is blocked, or something like that. Next slide. There's a good test, but it has a low throughput. It's like one cassette at a time. Most of the machines that have been bought just do four samples uh, in parallel. So for a busy lab, and if it takes you up to two hours, that doesn't mean very many samples in a day. It means if someone comes in the afternoon, they're unlikely to get their result and be put, go back to the clinician to be put on treatment the same day. It's, it's Batch-wise, it's, it's slow. You, have, you might have a queue of patients waiting to be tested. 
there are some concerns about the robustness of the technology. It's affected by temperature. The cassettes are, are not very stable at temperatures. They've got to be kept in, in air conditioning. The machines are breaking down now. They're, they don't seem to last very long. Models need replacing, which is quite expensive. So for someone that has donated them uh, an instrument, maybe two or three years later, they're going to get another request. Please, we need a few more thousand dollars to replace our, our modules. Um, it was not very robust. Um, as I said, as with all the other molecular tests, you can't use the monitor treatments. It's for new treatments only. And it's expensive. But tiered pricing is in place. And with assistance from unit aid, who put a consortium together to fund, um, there are subsidized uh, pricing arrangements for people in the public sector of low-income countries. And it's approximately about $10 per cassette, which for most people, the time they've got it imported and you know delivered, you're talking about $12 to $15 per test. The other problem with it is for rifampicin, which is great, it picks up rifampicin resistance, but it's not 100% accurate. It has been known to overdiagnose and give false positives and underdiagnose and give false negatives, which can, can produce problems for the individual patient's concerned. Next slide. So this is illustrate what happened. This was a, some studies in India. Uh, Within 10 months, about a third of the modules died and had to be replaced. Um, dust affects it, heat affects it. It needs a constant electricity supply, which is not there in many, many settings. Um, next slide. And the, the costs, there are a lot of hidden costs. You may, if you have to put in air conditioning, if you're in a hot country, um, if you need to do something about the amount of dust, um, you might actually, it's not just a case of buying an instrument. A study in Nigeria found between two and a half and nearly $10,000 need to be spent in the lab. Um, so it's not as cheap as it sounds. It might be great to be given one, but you may have to do some other work as well. Next slide. So people are now looking at the next generation, the third generation tests. And there's a few on the horizon, a few have been released. None of them so far have had endorsement from the WHO. And the one that's likely to turn next, get endorsement next, will be a new development from Cepheid. So it's using a similar technology, but they've done two things. One, they've designed a better cassette, which they hope will be more accurate and more uh, sensitive, and will be less prone to mistakes with the rifampicin resistance. The other thing they're working on is they have a, a new instrument which will be run from a battery. So you won't need power. You won't need to have your laptop computer running next. Um, so it, it should be a lot easier to, and robust to use. It, they're hoping it'll be, you'll be able to just pick it up and walk with it. It'll be like the size of a coffee grinder. Now, they're, they're currently with their co-developers find they're evaluating these uh, instruments and these new cassettes. And we were hoping they'd be released last year so everyone else would get their hands on them, but they're, they're being delayed and delayed. So we're hoping this year, perhaps for the Union Conference, there'll be some news. And hopefully, um, they'll then be released late this year or next year so other people can try them out and see if they're as exciting as they sound. Several other uh, companies and, and groups in China, India, different places are producing uh, tests or different versions and similar type technologies. But at the moment, it's still wait and see, as we have to see if people evaluate these tests and if they're as good as we hope they are. So at the moment, none of them are really ready to be used, or certainly not ready to be implemented. They're ready to be used to, to validate and evaluate. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is a point of the care test, which is quite exciting. It's from a company called the Lear. It's to test for TB in urine which is so much easier to get, obviously, than, uh, than sputum. Um, it's quick. It's quite cheap. The problem with this is that the, the compound it's looking for is not easy to find in the urine, and it seems to work on people who are very severely immunosuppressed, who've got very low CD4 counts. For someone who's not immunosuppressed, the test is hopeless. It's just not sensitive at all. But so in that very special group of people, and people are hospitalized, it has been shown to save lives in people immunosuppressed because you get a very quick answer. If the test is positive, they've got TB, you get them onto treatment quickly. If the test is negative, it doesn't mean they haven't got TB. 
it, you just have to continue doing other tests to find out what's wrong with that patient. But this is exciting. It's been approved. It, you know, it should be implemented anywhere for a patient who's severely immunosuppressed. Then you can do this quite cheap and easy to do test. Next slide. Um, just to remind you that TB is not just in the lungs. It's everywhere, anywhere. Um, this is just some data from the UK to show that roughly in the UK, United Kingdom, it's half and half. About half the people have pulmonary disease and half have disease in other parts of the body. Uh, very hard to detect. Uh, symptoms are horrendous and very difficult to identify symptoms because they're very, very vague. Um, next slide. So it's very hard to diagnose. You don't know where to sample. You don't suspect TB quite often. Very difficult to get hold of specimens. Quite often it has to be invasive. Uh, like for TB meningitis, you do a spinal tap and go in and take um, CSF from the spine. That's not a technique that can be done at point of care. These are you know, sophisticated sampling. Um, the, the tests themselves don't work so well. Things like pleural fusions. It's a very, very dirty sample. The molecular tests don't work very well with it. Um, so it, it still remains a big problem, uh, detecting extrapulmonary TB. Next slide. These are just some of the novel technologies in development. Just to show there's lots out there. There's lots of being published, lots of reports talk about these new technologies. As yet, none of them are there. Um, you know, one sooner or later, one has to work or work well enough. We're very good at detecting TB that's quite severe when people are very heavily infected. What we need is a test that, you know, we don't want to wait till someone's very, very heavily infected before we detect it. We want to know someone very quickly if they've got TB or not. Next slide. This is just to explain, it's on next and next, just to fill in the slide. Uh, next. And next again. Thank you. This is just to show you it's a long process. Of, um, you often see, you might see if you look in the scientific journals, people have got a great new test, they publish it. It will still be then several years before it goes into practice. And it's getting, it's manufactured, it's doing the evaluation, it's getting regulatory approval, and then it has to go into policy, and then it, it might get accepted. You can talk many, many years and a lawful lot of money. So just finding a new test is the very first step, the long process after that. So we, we'll have to wait a while, I think, before we get our perfect test. Um, and it's, it's not very attractive for companies to work on TB. Um, and it, it's very difficult to get investments to work on TB tests. So that's why we're, we're really begging for better investment from the public sector and, and the, the charity sector as well. Next slide. Oh, sorry, next one. So lots of barriers to TB test development. I'm not going to go into detail at all in this slide. Just to say the biggest barriers are finding the money. And the biology is very, very difficult. There aren't markers there jumping out at us to say, you know, use me, I'll be a good test for TB. Um, we also have the problem that we have these bad tests are being sold as well. We've got a problem with some products get championed, some don't. It's, it doesn't seem to be a lot of rationale as to what gets used and what doesn't get used at the moment. And it all comes down to the simple fact that there's a tiny amount of money available. You have to make very difficult choices. Next slide. So very briefly about drug resistance, it's becoming a much bigger problem, partly because we've now got very sophisticated bacteria who become immune, I should say, or they've mutated. Um, so they're resistant to many, many drugs. Um, so you know, mortality rates are very high. And if you have drug-resistant disease that doesn't get cured by the standard treatments, you might get put on standard treatment, but you'll stay infectious. And so TB, drug-resistant TB is spreading quite seriously and quite dramatically in some parts of the world. And another reason is that we need these tests for all the drugs because the new drugs we're having to use for drug-resistant TB are very toxic, very unpleasant very bad for the patients, you know, really uncomfortable and serious side effects. Um, so we can say which tailor the therapy to each patient that will help be so good for the patients. And the other problem is we now have a couple of new drugs to use, but
but the problem is we don't know who to how to use them. WHO is suggesting you should have at least five drugs available before you should treat someone for TB, for drug-resistant TB. And we sometimes don't have five drugs available. Or it might be that the patient doesn't have access to drug resistance testing to tell you which five drugs you can use. So you know that they might have resistance to rifampicin. You shouldn't use that. But you've no idea which other drugs to use. So we really do need to, to scale up and sort out drug resistance testing quite urgently. Next slide. So this is simply the explanation of drug resistance. You get mutations in the DNA, which changes to the proteins or the enzymes and the bacteria, so the drugs don't work anymore. What happens if you have inadequate therapy, which can happen for many reasons. People might not take their drugs, the drugs might not be effective, they might have a problem absorbing drugs, many, many reasons. But what happens is if the drugs aren't effective and you haven't got enough drugs there, then the drug resistance gets selected and suddenly you've got a big problem in your hands. Next slide, please. So there's lots of different types of mutations that cause resistance. The most common way, this is some jargon from molecular biologists, they're called SNPs. So they're, they're just tiny mutations. There's one single base within your DNA change, in the bacterial DNA changes. Um, but the big changes can occur as well. Whole genes can disappear sometimes and that can affect drug resistance. Next slide. So that the conventional way and the most accurate way is to grow the bacteria in the presence of drug and see if it grows or not. And this is slow. It's quite dangerous to do. Again, you need very stringent safety considerations if you're going to be handling TB. Drug resistance TB is even worse. And it basically, it's, it's just too slow. We, we need something faster. Next slide, please. So we need also to decide when, when do we use tests? Do we screen everyone at the beginning for drug resistance or do we wait to see if they fail treatment? And which drugs do we test for? Um, so there's lots of policy decisions that need to be made. We have molecular tests now that look for mutations. They're much faster and safer, but they're not as accurate yet as the culture-based tests. So we do need to hang on to culture for the time being because it's more accurate. We need to confirm quite often. Next slide. This is just an example. Uh, rifampicin is um, quite a simple acting drug. And there's one area of DNA that causes nearly all the, all the drug resistance. So it's quite easy to test for. There are other areas, though. Um, so the tests aren't perfect. We take a look at Fambatol. There are many, many genes and different Mutations can cause a problem or are associated with resistance in Fambatol. So if you're going to look at all the drugs, you can't just look at one test or two or three PCRs. It becomes a very complicated set of tests you have to use. Next slide. So sequencing uh, can detect all the mutations. This whole genome sequencing is all the rage now. It's um, the latest thing for all kinds of diseases. Um, it's by far the most accurate. It's already been used in some countries, mainly in research hospitals, but it's now being rolled out. Um, it can give you a comprehensive picture. So you can say, look, don't use this drug, this drug, this drug, but you can use this drug, that drug. So it would allow personalized treatment. It can differentiate who's got MDR and XDR and then tell you which drugs they should use. So it's wonderful, but, of course, there's always a but. Uh, it can't be done at the point of care. It's, the, the sample preparation is actually very difficult. Things are, are expensive, they're not particularly robust. Again, we're back to, you know, you'd have to have a good lab, you'd have to have air conditioning, dust control, etc., etc. And the other issue is we don't fully understand all the mutations, what they mean clinically. Um, so it's, it's unlikely to completely replace phenotypic or culture based methods entirely. But people are starting to seriously talk about it as the, the way we need to go. Next slide. There are risks. So the current molecular tests are the things like the expert, the gene expert, which tests for Fampersen, and the Hain line probe assays. This you do a DNA amplification and then you look for specific mutations within that amplification. The problem with these tests is they don't cover all the mutations, and sometimes they mistake mutation. And sometimes you get a mutation that causes a problem and another slightly different mutation doesn't cause a problem. So they're inaccurate. 
what's been happening is with particularly I think with the gene expert is it's picking up a lot of drug resistant metabolism, which is excellent, but it's missing some. And those patients are then, if they're negative in gene expert, people assume they don't have a famosin resistance. And of course, they do have their MDRTB and they're going on spreading their disease because they're not being uh, treated effectively. So we're now seeing reports as a report, I believe, in Swaziland, uh, which uh, they're seeing now a, a large proportion of patients that have a famosin resistance that's not detected by the line probe assay or the expert. So we've got to be aware of this and be watching for this. Um, and we need to do something about it, otherwise we'll end up with a huge problem of MDRTB that we can't detect. Next slide. And now I have to hand over to Erica, who's going to, I hope, infuse you all about diagnostics and get us all up and working to try and solve our problems and sort out TB. Over to you, Erica. Thank you, Ruth. Um, that was a really great overview of what's a pretty complicated field. Um, and like Ruth said, um, you know, I have I can tend to talk fast, so please let me know if I'm speaking too quickly. It just means I'm excited to talk to all of you <laughs> about this topic. Um, could we go to the next slide? The next slide, please. Oh, thanks. Um, so I think that the place where we should start out in talking about um, diagnostics advocacy for TB um, is really to think about um, access to TB treatment and prevention as well as diagnosis as a human right. And we obviously, as Ruth said, can't have treatment until we have diagnosis. So um, in some ways, you know, diagnosing TB is really where this all begins. Um, and we're doing really badly on it so far. Um, there are about 10 million TB cases a year estimated. And about 4 million of those are not diagnosed and notified. So we're currently missing about 40% or almost half of TB cases. Um, and I think that this is a real violation of human rights. Um, and you know, human rights, as you guys know, are um, these universal and inalienable rights um, that governments must work to respect, protect, and fulfill. Um, and the lack of um, access to TB diagnosis um, is really a violation of, of two main rights, the right to health and the right to the benefits of scientific progress. Um, so I would you know, encourage anybody who's interested um, in human rights and in health to really think about this lack of access to TB diagnostics and a lack of, of better diagnostics as failures of human rights. Um, and it really relates to the human rights concept of uh, or principle of equity. Um, because as Ruth mentioned, you know, there's uh, particular groups that are left out by the current standard for diagnosing TB. Children, people with HIV, people with extrapulmonary TB. Um, these people are really left out of the um, current system because we don't have better tests. Um, so, you know, now that you guys have an understanding of what the different tests are, um, I'd love to go through um, with you and kind of think about some of the priorities that we could bring forward for advocacy. Um, and I'll try to keep this short so that we have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end, and also just some discussion um, to think about moving forward. The next slide, please. So, you know, as discussed, diagnosis is the first step towards cure. Um, but I think, you know, Ruth's presentation highlighted very clearly that there um, are a lot of different tests, and this can be something that's kind of challenging for advocates. Um, it can be a little bit more difficult to understand what's going on in the diagnostic space than what's happening with something like drugs, um, in part because the diagnosis of TB has been so complicated and because we don't have really great tests. Um, we need to know about a lot of different tests because they all play kind of a different role in this puzzle of diagnosing TB. Next slide. Um, next slide. So to you know address this, I think the the first thing that I would advocate for all activists to prioritize is research. Um, in order to make things simpler, to make sure more people get access, to bring costs 
down, um, we actually need to invest more in research. The, the tests that we have right now, um, not all of them are very sensitive. Most of them are quite complicated and very expensive. Um, what we need instead is a really fast, non-invasive and accurate test um, for everybody, but especially to detect um, TB in children who are really um, left out of the current diagnostic tools currently. Um, and then we also need a test that's not based on sputum. So um, as Ruth mentioned, the serological or blood tests for TB haven't worked and they're actually recommended against using them from the WHO. Um, but something like a blood test, something like a urine test, the urine test we have right now only works in people with very low CD4 counts. Um, we need some other medium. Sputum is hard to cough up, especially for children. Um, people with HIV might not have a lot of sputum. Um, and they also can't find TB outside the lungs. And in, in many settings, you know, up to um, a third or half of of TB cases can actually be extrapulmonary TB, and we're just missing them completely when we use sputum-based tests. So the next slide. So to address this, um, one of the main challenges is making sure that there's enough funding for research. Um, the estimated amount that's needed is about $450 million a year um, for basic science. And we need basic science because we need to be able to understand you know, what could be some good markers of, of TB infection, um, what could show TB disease and distinguish it from infection that's not actually making someone sick. Um, we should have also ways to kind of look at um, whether TB is improving or worsening under treatment. All of these things actually have to come from the kind of basic lab science side of things, um, even before we get into the um, perfecting and developing a test side of things. Um, and then on the diagnostic side itself, um, we're really failing to invest enough in TB R&D. Um, you can see here we have about 63 million being invested in 2015. That's a 300 million dollar gap. Um, and when you think about, you know, the billions of dollars that get invested in um, in HIV research each year, um, it's really kind of a drop in the bucket. But TB has been marginalized and not prioritized. So I think the first thing that we should all um, think about doing is is really pushing our governments and pushing private companies and pushing foundations to invest more in TB research and development. Um, and Ruth had referred to the um, to the Gene Expert Omni system, which would be more rugged. It's smaller. Um, it would avoid some of the problems that the current Gene Expert system has. Um, this has been in development for several years and is moving um, pretty slowly, although it's under evaluation now. Um, and for the Gene Expert platform, there's also a cartridge that could diagnose XDR-TB, um, not just re resistance to rifampicin as is currently done. Um, but for these kind of um, technologies that are in the pipeline to move forward quicker and to actually reach people who need them, um, we really need to invest more in TB research. Next slide. So after things are developed, we want to make sure that they get taken up. Um, and we do have you know, imperfect tools for diagnosing TB. But with what we have, we could do, be doing a much better job than we're doing now. There's really no excuse for missing 4 million cases of TB a year with the current tools that we have. Next slide. So we'll just walk through um, some of the different steps kind of along the pathway for diagnosis. And I have some suggestions here for ways that activists can intervene um, and where I think you know, some of the challenges are that could be um, remedied. But you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts afterwards. Um, so when you start at the really basic level, first you need to figure out who to test for TB. And since the tests are um, you know, somewhat difficult and sometimes expensive, it doesn't make sense to just test everybody on the street for TB. You need some method of screening people first. Um, and I think activists can play a large role in, in advocating for appropriate screening in their communities just to start getting people you know, into the path 
towards diagnosis. Um, this could be things like conducting treatment literacy in their communities um, so that people are aware of what the symptoms of TB are and can bring themselves to a healthcare facility. This is one of the areas where the HIV movement has been really successful um, and where TB, I think, has really failed. There's not a lot of um, treatment or diagnosis literacy in TB. Um, and another thing activists can do is, you know, encourage their national and their local programs to institute policies and practices for symptom screening. Um, so if any of you on the webinar are HIV activists, which I assume that you are, you know, a lot of this, I wrote local TB programs, but it should really be TB and HIV programs, as well as, you know, maternal and child health programs, because um, there are often people at really high risk from TB in some of these other groups, um, but all the disease areas are, are working in their silos. Um, and not thinking about how to um, reach out to other populations who are at high risk. Next slide, please. So um, another great step along the pathway, as Ruth mentioned, is chest x-ray. Um, and this is really underutilized in TB. Um, it's a platform you know, that is used across a lot of different disease areas. So um, it, it could be something that could be taken up a lot more readily for TB. It's not a perfect way of finding TB, but it can definitely help. Um, so activists could avail advocate for the availability of, um, of digital chest x-ray. Um, what we've been hearing is that even when x-ray is available, um, it can patients can have to pay out of pocket for it in a way that they wouldn't for, say, a standard sputum smear test. Um, so the, the x-ray should be available and it should be free. Um, TB is a, you know, a public health disease and um, it's actually cost effective for governments to pay for screening and treatment. Um, Advocates could also, you know, ask for um, good referrals to follow-up tests in addition to chest x-ray to confirm the presence of TB. Since the x-ray isn't a perfect test, you know, you might need to follow up um, with tests to confirm whether it's actually TB or whether it could be something like pneumonia or lung cancer. Um, and then, as Ruth mentioned, there are some tools coming down the pipeline um, that might help make x-ray um, a lot more accurate and so people can keep an eye on what the WHO is reviewing in terms of the evidence. Um, in the next few months the WHO should issue some policy um, about computer assisted reading tools and if they say that these tools are good to use I think that's something that we could bring forward because it reduces a lot of the or it could reduce a lot of the human error in reading x-rays and help make TB, detecting TB a lot faster and more accurate. Next slide. Um, so once we kind of move past the, the screening and the x-ray stage, um, we should think about what, what we can do to really advocate for quality testing. Um, there are a lot of issues around the individual tests that we'll go into, but almost all of these, you need to have a strong specimen transport system and a strong referral system to make sure that um, the, the patients where they're being seen, um, the specimen can actually go to the lab since most diagnosis isn't happening on site since we don't really have a point of care test for most people. Um, and then to make sure that you know, the people are actually being linked to care. It doesn't do much to diagnose someone with TB unless they actually get connected to good treatment. Um, so we should advocate for strong specimen transport and referral systems. And it doesn't sound very sexy, but it's a really important part of um, making sure that people get the care that they need. Um, Activists could also think about, you know, advocating for the use of more accurate tests, um, such as Gene Expert as the initial test. Um, as Ruth mentioned, Gene Expert MTB RIF was recommended in in 2010. Um, it's seven years later, and some countries are using it a lot, but in most countries, sputum smear microscopy is still the first test, um, and we know that this test doesn't work as well especially in kids and people with HIV. Um, so it can be, you know, expensive to use GeneXpert. It's not a perfect test, um, but relying on smear, we're missing a ton of cases, um, even in the best of circumstances. Um, so when spear microscopy is used, um, there are ways to make it slightly better, slightly more sensitive using um, Convention, uh, sorry, using LED microscopy. So when smear is used, activists can call for you know LED microscopes. But really, I think we should be using 
um, moving more towards using some of these highly sensitive and specific tests like GeneXpert. Next slide. We can't forget about culture. It's the gold standard, and even though it takes some time, it's a really important part of making sure that we have the kind of full knowledge of what someone's TB is resistant to, um, as well as you know being able to monitor treatment. Um, so activists really shouldn't forget about culture, um, and making sure that liquid capacity in particular is available in reference labs in their countries is, would be really helpful because um, with liquid culture, it moves a little faster, as Ruth mentioned, so you can get results in a couple weeks instead of several months. Um, so we shouldn't really, we really shouldn't let um, countries off of the hook for doing something like culture. It is expensive. Um, you do need to have laboratory safety in place, um, but that doesn't mean it can't or shouldn't be done. And they actually have some pretty cool kind of um, container laboratories now that come um, mostly set up and you can, you know, someone could just order them for, for you know, tens of thousands of dollars and plop it in their country, um, and that could be faster, you know, than trying to build all these um, high-level biosafety labs. So there, um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but it, it's not an excuse for not doing it. Um, and we should also really put pressure on the companies to make the prices come down and make it easy for countries to buy these machines. Becton Dickinson is the company that makes the liquid culture machine. Um, they have a very variable tiered pricing scheme. Um, really, an affordable price should be available for all low and middle income countries. Um, and part of the problem with that we'll see throughout TB diagnosis um, is that the, it's, we're really working in a, a market of monopolies. So until we invest more in research and come up with you know, more alternatives and have a lot of different players in the field, companies are going to be able to keep charging whatever they want for tests, and people are going to, you know, as a result, have less access. Um, so we really need to hit on all fronts, more research, um, getting countries to uphold their part of it, and then pressuring companies to make their products more affordable and accessible. Next slide. So line probe assays, LPAs, are, um, I think of them as kind of in between gene expert and, in, and culture. Um, they can find resistance to more drugs than just gene expert can, um, and they work faster than culture, but they don't um, have quite as accurate results as culture. They also require, um, you know, high level of biosafety in labs and, and take up room. Um, but they are a really important part in this puzzle, especially now that there's a short course regimen for drug-resistant TB. You need to figure out who's eligible to take that and make decisions pretty quickly about who to start on treatment. And LPA is um, probably the best way that we have to do that right now, um, being able to, you know, kind of rapidly file um, which kind of patients could get this and which have too much resistance and still need the longer two month, uh, sorry, two year regimen. Um, so LPAs are important. Um, and again, because of the monopolistic market that we're in, um, the price is quite high. And so, you know, advocating for Hind to implement, you know, fair and volume-based pricing for its products um, could help motivate uptake um, while we're working towards price reduction. Next slide. As Ruth mentioned, this is um, the LAM test is the only point of care test that we have right now in TB. Um, it's not a perfect test. It misses a lot of cases, um, but it's um, very fast and very simple and inexpensive, and it works pretty well in a population that's at extremely high risk of dying for TB. Um, it's actually the only test that we've seen in a clinical trial that's been able to have an impact on mortality. Um, using LAM in people who were hospitalized with severe HIV infection um, and it, sorry, advanced HIV disease, um, using LAM actually helped reduce the number of deaths because it works so fast, it's so easy, it's just kind of a urine dipstick like a pregnancy test. Um, it meant that people could get diagnosed and started on treatment um, a few days earlier, and just those couple days made a difference in how many people survived. So right now, um, no country is routinely using LAM. 
And I think this is a, a tragedy. <laughs> this is a test that's extremely simple, cheap, would be very easy to introduce. Um, and the company, Alir, will probably stop producing the test if they don't start selling product. Um, so I think anybody who's you know living or working in a, a high TB HIV burden country should really push their countries to procure the lamb test, to roll it out immediately, only in the recommended population, only in people with CD4 counts of less than 100. Um, but we should really be putting pressure on countries to do this. This is um, a, a real missed opportunity if we're not using all the tools that we have in the toolbox right now. Um, some countries um, might require registration of the test, so it might you know, also require asking a leer to register the test in country, um, as well as working with the regulatory agencies to make sure that the LAM test actually gets approved. Next slide. We touched a bit um, on testing for TB infection. Um, so I wanted to just bring that up here, um, especially for people who are working in, in lower burden settings. Um, there should be you know, some access to, to testing for TB infection. Um, there, there should never be using these tests for de detecting active TB. Um, so these tests should never you know, be used in a high burden country to diagnose um, active TB and put somebody on anti-TB treatment. It's really more in prevention. Um, we should advocate also for the availability of preventive therapy. The whole point of testing for TB infection is, is to figure out who's vulnerable for de developing active disease. And um, per you know, the, the normative guidance, either from the WHO or in a country, um, we should all be making sure that preventive therapy is available. It's, it's not in many countries. Um, and we should be advocating for more research to find out who's at risk of progressing from latent TB to active disease um, so that we can best identify people and put them on, on treatment and have the best impact from it. Um, but I just wanted to highlight here, in high burden settings, um, people with HIV are, don't need to have testing for TB infection to be started on preventive therapy. So um, if you know, you're living in a country that has a lot of HIV and TB, um, if someone is HIV positive and they don't have active TB disease, we should be advocating for them to get put on preventive therapy. They don't even need to do the IGRA or TST. So these tests um, have a role, but they're not you know, so urgent in a lot of these settings. What's more important and what we've seen from the evidence is that it's just worth putting high-risk people with HIV on treatment Oh, sorry, on preventive treatment, um, even before having a test. Next slide. Um, Ruth mentioned that there have been some tests that the WHO has you know, disapproved, which was a really big deal for them. So we want to make sure that tests that shouldn't be used aren't being used. Um, in China and India, these serological or blood tests are used for the diagnosis of TB, um, and they really shouldn't be. The tests were actually banned in India. So anybody who's you know working in a setting and, and sees someone getting um, referred for blood testing for active TB, um, that should set off some alarms, and um, we should make some noise about that. Um, we should create accountability for the inappropriate use or marketing of these tests by laboratories and companies. Um, and we should call for governmental oversight to protect against the use and marketing of these tests. Um, the gene drive is an unapproved test. Um, the WHO reviewed the evidence and, and actually saw that it looked worse than sputum smear microscopy, um, so it was not recommended. It hasn't you know, been banned in the way serological tests are, but it's clearly a test that needs a lot more um, development if it's going to be suitable for use in TB. Um, and this test is actually on the market in India, um, it being used in private laboratories. So um, you know, we should also be monitoring for the use of tests that, that aren't approved yet because they don't have, or, or aren't recommended yet because they don't have robust evidence um, to support their use. Next slide. So that was it mostly, you know, I wanted to do a quick run through. Um, one thing I wanted to mention too that isn't in the slides is that um, the gene expert test, it, it is expensive, um, but we have an opportunity, particularly for those of you who are working in HIV advocacy as well, um, in that 
Gene Expert is a platform that can be used for different disease areas, and it's already recommended to do early infant diagnosis of HIV. Um, it can work for a lot of other conditions, and it might wind up being approved for viral load monitoring. Um, and so even though there's kind of a monopoly in TB, there might be ways that we can, you know, band together across disease areas and um, advocate for, you know, since these platforms can be used for multiple um, conditions that you know that can help bring the price down because programs can share the cost within their countries um, volumes might go up so we should be advocating for volume based pricing um, so I think we have some opportunities to get creative even when we're in these um, monopolistic markets um, I wanted to you know highlight the diagnostics guide that tag out. We went over a lot of information today, so you might want to refer um, back to some of this in more detail. So um, the link to that is um, on the slide here. Um, and feel free to reach out to me if you have questions um, afterwards or if you want to work together to come up with advocacy plans in your countries for access to diagnostics. Um, I would be very happy to work with any of you on that. Um, thanks, and I think we'll open it up to questions and at Jenny's moderation.